been written and narrated by Susan Pike. Introduction. I like to think that I've always had a creative side to me in my mind. As I've gotten older and now entering my early 20s, that creative side of me has gotten damped over time, mainly by mental health struggles and age. When I was younger, I had no idea how to express my feelings and thoughts, so I would bottle everything up. So as you're reading this book, you're reading everything from my dreams and nightmares to my dark thoughts and what I thought would be my last words. This is a roller coaster of a book. There is no direct storyline from ill to cured. This is a very dark, raw, and real book that contains subjects like depression, PTSD, anxiety, suicide, death, and self-harm. This is coming from an older version of myself who was filled with anger, hurt, sadness, and grief. I have now learned how to cope with this and continue to cope with some stuff. If any of what this book contains bother you, then simply don't read it. Thank you. Chapter 1. Childhood My childhood was relatively happy. I had a ton of fun with my friends, sleepovers, making t-shirts, drawing with chalk, etc. I think the real trouble started when I began school. Every kid cries on their first day of school, but for me, it wasn't just the first day, second day, or even the first week. It was every single day of the school year. I think that was really the start of my anxiety. It gradually got worse. I started to be obsessed with checking the weather to see if it was going to be sunny or rainy. If it was sunny, then I knew it was going to be a good day. But if it was going to be rainy, then I would cry all day. It didn't matter if it was going to be sunny later on or if it was sunny and then it was going to be rainy later on. It needed to be 100% sunny for me to be happy. I think that was the start of my depression. I was around the ages of six or seven, so I had no way of explaining why I was sad. On top of that, I started to get bullied and picked on by the older kids. Most of it was on the bus. The older kids would crumble up paper from their notebooks and throw it at me, and it would hit me. The bus driver we had was the sweetest woman ever, and if I could find her and give her the biggest hug ever and say thank you, then I would. Every day when the bus would come to pick me and the other kids up, she would always greet us with a good morning. And when we got dropped off at school, she would say, have a good day. One day, I got on the bus crying. She asked, oh, sweetie, what's wrong? I told her that the older kids picked on me. She wiped my tears and said, oh, don't let them bother you. I'll have to talk with them, all right? I nodded, then proceeded to sit down and went on with the rest of my day. The next day I got on, it was quiet and nobody bothered me, both to and from school. I think that day was the first day I got off the bus with a smile on my face. During my childhood is when I made my first best friend. She was a girl around my age that lived only a couple blocks away from me. We became best friends quickly. She would always stand up for me against the older kids. Over time, the bullies and everything else at school became a bit easier to deal with. That summer, the summer of 2010, my family bought a house in the next town over, so we had to move. It was sad to leave my friends, but we still promised to hang out whenever we could. Chapter 2. My First Experience with Death Everything was different now. A new house, new town, new school, everything. I thought that I was cool with so much being different, but at the same time I was worried that I wasn't going to make many friends because I was the new kid, and from what I've seen in the movies, the new kid is always the punching bag to others. Thankfully, the stereotypes from movies were proven wrong as the kids across the street befriended me quite quickly. They were the first friends I made there. There was another kid who lived on the same street as me, but we never hung out that much. Soon enough, it was time for school. I still cried on every day. Over time, it just became the first day. Then once I reached high school, it became no days at all, for the most part. 
Looking back on that now, I realize that all of that was my anxiety and being obsessed with the weather was the beginning of my depression. Fast forward to summer of 2014, I made friends and hung out with them almost every day until the streetlights came on. The beginning of school was actually fun. The teacher I had was, and is, still my favorite teacher. That Sunday, Sunday, September 17th, or September 20th, 2014, I think, that day we stayed home from church, and when that happens, we watch a Christian movie, and then afterwards we have a quiz on what it was about. The movie that day was my favorite one, The Little Less Angel. So we watched it and had the quiz afterwards. My father asked me, hey, do you know Rena? Rena was the girl that lived two blocks from me back in my old neighborhood. I said in a happy tone, yeah, is she coming over? There was a pause for a moment before he said, she passed away. It took a few seconds for my brain to connect the dots, but once it did, my whole world was crushed. After that, I was never the same. Crying all the time, staying in bed all day, not eating or drinking. The next week, I don't remember the date, was the wake. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I wore this black dress with purple hearts on it with a black overcoat. The ride to the funeral home, I was numb. But once we pulled into the parking lot of it, I just broke down. As we approached the entrance, I saw Rena's and I's favorite teacher. She hugged me and said, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. As we entered the building, there were two rooms. To the direct right of us were chairs all lined up and a monitor to the right of the chair showing a slideshow of pictures and playing butterfly kisses. To the left of us was the main room with the casket and the flower circle thing with a picture of her mounted on a stand. Chairs lined up with family members and friends. Most of them were crying their eyes out, but some of them didn't show any any emotion at all. I never understood why they didn't show emotion, but now I've been to a couple more funerals and I figured out that everyone deals with grief in in their own way. Some wear on their sleeve, and some are stoic. As we sat down in the chairs in the side room with the monitor, I couldn't help but cry. I was feeling so many emotions at once. Sadness, anger, devastation, confusion, denial, everything. It was my mother's decision to bring me into the main room to see her. We had these rubber band crosses that we made the day before the funeral. Rina's Rina's was made with her favorite colors, pink and purple. Mine was made with a dark and light blue, my favorite colors. As we entered the doorway, it only took me looking to my left a little bit to see my best friend laying the cat in in a casket, lifeless, pale, and cold. I collapsed right there, crying uncontrollably, and I think I was screaming too. All I could think is, why her? My mother kept saying to me, it's just a shell. Her soul is up in heaven. She's only sleeping. But I already knew the truth. She was gone forever. As we sat down back in the side room, Rena's uncle came up to me and started explaining to me how she died. I'm sure he meant well and maybe in some way that this would be a good time to tell me. But all I wanted to do was scream, shut the fuck up, at him. Now I have grasped the mindset of everyone is here for a reason. The people that enter your life are there to teach you a lesson. Once they are done teaching, they return home in heaven. That mindset is the reason I don't get upset as much anymore with certain things. I don't remember much from the days following this. Chapter 3 Aftermath. The rest of that year went by like a complete blur. The only thing I remember doing was just laying in my bed, crying, sleeping, going to school, and doing it all over again. I do remember my first day back at school, but only the morning portion of it. The national anthem played. I walked to class. My friend asked me, why are you crying? That's it. 
I also remember my last days at church too. That said, the segment that week was ironically death. I could stay for the opening songs, but as soon as the testimony started, I couldn't take it and I broke down crying. I never had gone back to church since then. Chapter 4 The RP I think late 2014 or early 2015 is when I began therapy. My therapist was the most amazing and comforting person you would ever meet. Her name was Joy, funnily enough. I remember the first day with her. She asked me those get-to-know-you type of questions. Then came the question, has anyone close to you died recently? Then, of course, I started crying and my mother answered the question for me. For the first couple of months, I didn't really dive into Rena's death with my therapist. Eventually, little by little, I started opening up. At the beginning of therapy, she recommended that I start something to distract my mind from the trauma and PTSD I suffered. So I did just that. I started dance and YouTube almost at the same time. YouTube and Instagram. I started my first ever Instagram account around the same time as YouTube, February 2015. And it was actually super fun creating those videos and such until the concerning stuff I said started happening. Chapter 5. True Feelings On YouTube, I didn't really post what I was truly feeling much, but on Instagram I was. It started off as a regular spam post of the music I was listening to and photos of myself, but shortly over time I started posting that I was depressed, suicidal, and wanted to die. I never thought of it as concerning. I only thought of it as an outlet that I was letting what I felt go. I stopped that Instagram account around early 2019 because my email that I used for it got hacked. To this day, I have no way of getting back into that account, which is probably for my own good. Chapter 6. Dance Shortly after I started the RP, I entered dance. I loved to dance. It was the one place where I could just be me and no one would judge. The one place I had actual friends that didn't bully me or anything. Dance was like my own personal world. Once I entered those doors, it was like the whole floor was mine to do whatever I want. The recitals were fun too. Of course I would get super nervous when we were up next, but all of my girls supported me and once I got on that stage, the nerves left. I did dance for about three years, 2015 to early 2018. I stopped because at the beginning of 2018 is when my depression really kicked in and I wasn't interested in the group games we did together. I also stopped because before the recital in summer 2017, I hurt my back pretty bad. My original trick was to do a handstand forward roll. It is exactly how it sounds. But when I went up into a handstand and went to do the forward roll part, I forgot to tuck myself in the ball and landed flat on my back on the hard tile floor. I've had problems with my back ever since, including mild scoliosis, so my back hurts every day. It hurts a lot, but really it hurts a little. Chapter 7. Bullying Ever since I started school, I've been picked on, teased at, mocked, called names, etc. The beginning of it was at the end of fifth grade. This girl that I was friends with began to turn on me and ignore me. I guess it can be chalked up as typical eight-year-old behavior, but she really acted like she had a problem with me. Sixth grade was the beginning of the worst. Kids still ignored me, but not in like a I'm pretending I can't hear you type of way, but in the you're invisible type of way. Kids would constantly shove themselves into me, hit me, etc. Then And then acted like they did nothing wrong. They also began to mock my voice every time I would speak, so eventually I just stopped talking. Seventh grade was the pinnacle of the bullying. No one would talk to me, help me out with my locker. They called me names like Slut, Skank, Elmo, Squirrel, Freak, Loser, Bitch, A Nobody, Worthless, Fat, Stupid, etc. Nobody, nobody would pick me to be their partner, so I was always working alone, which I was fine with because I got to do things my way. The bullying wasn't just in school either. It was online as well. 
YouTube was filled with comments like, You're annoying. Shut up. Why don't you start making content? You sound like you smoke 80 packs of cigarettes a day. Stuff like that. Instagram was worse. Comments like, Ugly, bitch, we get it. You're depressed. Just get help. In messages like, Kill yourself. No one likes you. Worthless. Fat. No one would care if you died. Etc. In school, the bullying became progressively worse. There was this one girl who always had problems with me, and we would bicker every day. There were also these group of four boys and three girls who disliked me as well, shutting my locker in my face each time I just opened it, interrupting me every time I spoke, spreading rumors about me fucking all of the teachers because I was a whore. The girls even took this fucked up approach and made a scar and made a song calling me a slut and how I would go down on everyone and they sang it in front of the entire class. You may be wondering, well why didn't you tell anyone? But I did tell all the teachers and reported them countless times to the vice principals. The thing is, all they ever said to me was, kids will be kids, just ignore them, shit like that. The combination of both the kids picking on me and the teacher and vice principals not doing anything drove me to my first suicide attempt that year. The only people that took me seriously was my family and the principal of the school, Mr. Theriot. I'm pretty sure I spelled his name wrong. He was the most amazing principal I ever had. Both him and only one of the vice principals, Dr. Lewis, who is now the principal of the middle school, those two took it seriously. They knew that I was doing YouTube, so they told me to make a video of what the bullies were doing to me and to list their first and last names and send them a direct link to the video. So I did just that. Once they got the information that they needed, they told me to take down the video because it contained first and last names along with graphic detail, to which I proceeded to do. Either that same week or the week after, they scheduled a private meeting with me, my family, the bullies, their parents, the guidance counselor, Dr. Lewis, and Mr. Theriot. I met with the bullies individually and told each one of them what they were doing to me and how it hurt me. The bullies needed to confirm that what they that they were doing this to me. The bullies' parents even hugged me and told me that they would be grounded and were told by Dr. Lewis and Mr. Theriot that they would be suspended from school for a week to face the consequence of what they have done. After that, they never bothered me again. They helped me with my things, stood up for me. We eventually became friends and shared many laughs. When eighth grade came along, no one bullied me. I made a ton of friends and eventually became mildly popular. In high school, sure, some of the kids picked on me here and there. But at that time, I stood up for myself and my friends, so the bullies never even bothered me. It continued like that throughout high school. No one ever really bothered me. Even now, I only, I only encounter the occasional asshole, but I know how to stand up for myself and I have friends to back me up. Chapter 8. My Suicide Attempts Before I get into this, I want to adjust that suicide and depression are not a joke and should not be treated as a joke. If you or loved ones suffer from severe depression or suicidal thoughts, please contact the Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or their updated number 988, and you will be connected to a crisis employee right away and will be able to get the help that you need. Thank you. I mentioned earlier that the kids in 7th grade that were bullying me and the teachers that never helped drove me to my first suicide attempt. That same day that the girls made that song about me and sung it in front of the whole class was the same day I would attempt to take my life. When I got home that day, I acted like I was just going to change out of my school clothes and into my pajamas. So I went up to my room, shut the door, and found a medium-length ribbon that was in a drawer. I tied one end to my closet doorknob and the other end around my neck like a noose. I slowly slumped down as the ribbon got tighter around my neck and cut off my earway. As I waited to run out of air, there was a voice that said, You can't do this. I thought it was just part of the whole dying process, so I just ignored it. 
I slumped down a bit more, and this is when the whipping began to cut off my earway. The voice grew louder as if commanding, you are not going to do this. I won't allow it. Doing this isn't going to make anything better. Think of what you went through. Do you want your family to go through the same thing? I, again, proceeded to ignore it. The voice eventually began to grow into a force in my body and made me stop what I was doing. There were scissors on my dresser, so I reached up and grabbed those and carefully cut the ribbon around my neck. When cut through, I, I then began coughing and then went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror to see that the ribbon had left a red mug all around my neck. So I took a hot shower to make my skin look all red so that it wasn't as noticeable. I then changed into my pajamas and then went downstairs to eat dinner. Later that night, I took the ribbon off of my door and threw it in the back of my closet. The second attempt was in 8th grade. I don't know why I did it, because 8th grade was the only great years in middle school that I had. But I went home, took a bubble bath, sunk myself under the water, and closed my eyes. I waited for myself to run out of air and breathe in the water and proceed to drown. Well, soon enough, I ran out of air, but proceeded to stay under the water. I did breathe in water, but the reaction of my body pulled me out of the water. I proceeded to cough and cough until I coughed up all the water that I had just breathed in a few seconds before. For about a week after I had this really terrible cough, I just chalked it up to me being sick, which funnily enough, I did get sick later that week. The third attempt was in early freshman year. It was also in the bathroom. I was taking a hot shower, closed the door, put my clothes at the bottom of the door so it blocked the gap. I let the steam fill the room and laid in the bathtub and waited for my asthma to kick in and to start and stop my breathing. My asthma did kick in quickly, but I just stayed there until I couldn't take it anymore. I quickly finished my shower and got out of the bathroom to where I could breathe again. The fourth attempt wasn't as much as of an attempt as it was a thought and a letter. I was in school, freshman year. I stared out the window and thought about jumping off of the school roof to my death. So I wrote a letter saying, I'm sorry, I had to do this. I know you don't understand, but I hope you forgive me. And just kept it there in my notebook in case I needed it. My friend found the note and asked me what it was. I made up an excuse and said that I was writing an apology letter to my other friend and was trying to come up with a good apology. My fifth and final attempt was nearing the end of freshman year, when my self-harm was at its peak, and I just thought about slitting both of my arms open and bleeding out. So I tried countless times to do that, but the things I was using wasn't working. So in class one day, we had these mason jars, and one kid accidentally knocked his off of the table and shouted everywhere. I thought, perfect. I kept a small shard of the glass and later went in the bathroom and pulled it out and put it to my arm and I was like, this is stupid. And then I threw the shard of glass away. And I'm glad I never went fully through with these attempts because I would have never met the amazing friends and people that are in my life now. Life is truly way too short for that bullshit. Chapter 9. Self-harm. From the beginning of middle school to the end of freshman year, I self-harmed four years. It went unnoticed for the longest time because I made excuses and wore long sleeves all year round. It started as me using the corners of my white bookshelf that created small enough cats to where I could, to where if anyone saw them I could blame them on the cat. Then it moved to using pieces of my wicker basket that I had on my desk at home. It created slightly noticeable cuts so I would just use PRL on them to progress their healing process faster. At the end of 8th grade is when I got the large scar on my leg from using the piece of glass I got from this blue cat that I got from the, an antique shop. My friends at the time and I created an emo club. So while my parents were at the store, I took the broken ear from the glass cat and took a video of me swiping it across my right leg because I thought it would be edgy and cool. The third time I did it, it slightly three inch long and half inch deep cut across my leg and blood started pouring out everywhere. 
I threw the tablet down and used my shirt to create a tourniquet and wrapped, the, and wrapped it above the cut and used another shirt to put pressure on the cut. I grabbed my What to Do in an Emergency book and quickly hobbled my way to the bathroom and into the shower. I rapidly flipped the book open to the cut section and followed the rules. I was already doing two of the rules. One, make a tourniquet. Two, keep pressure on the wound. The third rule was to try and wash it, so that's what I did. Bad idea. Once more martyr hit the cut, it burned like fire. I never got lava on myself, but I imagine that's what it feels like. I turned the water off and quickly went back to applying pressure on the wound. The next step was said, call 911. I couldn't do that because if I did, my parents would find out what I was doing to myself. So I looked in the medicine cabinet and grabbed the box of band-aids. At this point, I heard the front door open and knew that my parents were back from the store. I quickly took a rag from under the sink and washed the blood off from my leg, the tub, the bathroom floor, the bathroom door, down the hallway to my room, my bedroom door, and I tried washing blood out of the cupboard. Since it was still fresh, it came out easily. Then I threw the bloody rag at the bottom of my laundry basket and threw the rest of my dirty clothes on top of it to conceal it. I then sat on the floor, putting the towel down first, then I removed the pressure. Luckily, since I had pressure on it that whole time, along with the tourniquet I made, the bleeding stopped. It filled up with blood pretty fast, so I kept applying pressure to it. I opened the box of band-aids and scattered them across the floor in a pile. I took the, I took the big square-sized ones and put those on the wound first. I stretched out my legs straight, which hurt like hell, to get the skin closer together. Then I squeezed the clean as close as I could together and began applying the band-aids. When I got to the middle of the room, it was near impossible to make the skin come closer together, but I still tried. When I was out of the big band-aids, I moved on to the ones that looked like triangles on both sides and used those to go on top of the ones I put down earlier. Once I was out of the triangle shape band-aids, I used the finger band-aids. Luckily, I only used a few on the outside to make sure it would stay on tightly. After I was done, I put the rest of the band-aids back in the box and put the box back in the medicine cabinet and then got pajamas on. Stupid me, I wore shorts and went downstairs. I was passing by to go to the kitchen. My father asked, what happened to your leg? I panicked and replied with, oh, I just scratched it. He said, that doesn't look like a scratch. I didn't say anything back and went into the kitchen. In freshman years, when the cell phone really escalated, I used the ends of my pencils and bit down on the metal pole so that the ends would be sharp enough so I could hold myself all over. It became all up and down my arms and legs. Some of the cuts were deep, others weren't. No one noticed. I would do it all the time at school, at home, didn't matter. I would just wash my arms and legs with the warm soap and water and then uh, put pure and aloe lotion to accelerate the healing process. I would use rubbing alcohol as well. It stained, but I quickly wasn't bothered by it anymore. It was unseen. It went unseen for the longest time until it didn't. Chapter 10 Crisis In May of 2019, I was at home having myself a nice glass of iced tea. It was the powder kind, so I realized that I made it too sweet, so I poured some of it down the bathroom sink and then went back to what I was doing. A little bit later, my mother came into my room and, and asked if I was cutting myself. I said no, and she told me that the bathroom sink was filled with blood. I said no and quickly explained that it was the iced tea. She didn't believe me and told me to roll up my sleeves. Now my secret was out. She saw all the cuts and yelled at me for it. She took pictures of them. I'm not sure why, but at that point, I just wanted to be left alone. About a week after that, I was just eating dinner when all of a sudden, a sudden anxiety attack came on. About a week after that, I was just eating dinner when all of a sudden an anxiety attack came on. In the midst of it, I said that I was suicidal, to which she asked me if I wanted to get help. And I said, I don't want to get help. I need to get help. She, then she took me to a crisis admission center. I was taken in the back to a room and waited for the people who asked questions to come in. While I was waiting, my mother began taking pictures of me to make me feel better, I guess. But I really didn't want a camera in my face, so I told her, get that camera out of my face. She listened.
Later that night, one of the counselors came in and said to me that it was against the rules to not be with everyone at the same time. I didn't say anything because at this point I was just sick of questions, mad at my parents for sticking me in the cell hole, and wanted to be left alone. I rolled over and went to sleep. The next week and a half at this place were awful and didn't help at all. Everyone needed to follow a strict schedule. The counselors were only a couple years older than us. The oldest person there was the nurse, and she was about late 20s, early 30s. There was no sugar allowed, no touching, no cars to parents. Everyone had to do schoolwork. Visits were only 15 to 30 minutes long and twice a week. The therapy group was playing just dance and watching little old children's movies. There was nothing helpful about that place at all. Little well. One day I noticed that everyone was taking this weird little round yellow pill. I tried asking what the pill was, but no one would tell me. And the nurse tried to get me to take it, and I'm like, what is that? She's like, it's your anxiety medication. And I'm like, I know what my anxiety medication looks like, and it doesn't look like that. I'm not taking that yellow pill. The girl next to me is like, if you refuse, they can keep you here for longer. And I said, let them. I'm not taking something that clearly isn't my medication. That same day was visit day for me. I told them about the no sugar thing, so they snuck in some gummy bears for me. And then oh, while I was there, I told them about the mor- that morning's yellow pill incident. My, my mother went and talked with one of the nurses, and the nurse just brushed it off and said that I was refusing to take my medication, which I wasn't, but whatever. The second week of my stay there began, and on Tuesday, I think I was being discharged. I was so happy that I was being discharged. I made some good friends there, but I'm not in contact with them now because there was no sharing social media with each other, with each other for some reason. But needless to say, I was glad I got out of there. The first thing I did was get some Wendy's and sugar and then celebrate. I was also surprised with my first ever phone that my parents got me. I had a week before I was put in the partial crisis program, so I went to school and reunited with my friends. It was near the end of school, so it was a pretty fun week. Then it was time to go to the partial crisis program, which was so much better than the BHN house I was admitted to. It worked like a school so that we could go home at the end of the day. There was an actual therapy group and therapeutic activities. That place helped me out so much better than the beach and house, and I would go back to that pro show program again. Like, I loved that place. Chapter 11, Healing. After I got out of crisis, I felt good. Not 100% better, but good. I had a new burst of confidence and self-esteem. I even chopped off 12 inches of my hair and dyed it red. For the first time in five years, I felt happy. Genuinely happy. My cut started to heal and that huge cut on my leg healed over. And since it was the summertime, I went swimming a lot and the chlorine from the pool helped a lot. I did a complete deep clean of my room, removing everything that I used to harm myself with. I downloaded two apps that helped me heal that helped me heal and made my mental health get better. Hashtag self care and I am sober. All the cuts are healed and completely gone now. I'm planning on getting a tattoo of the scar on my leg. Chapter 12, The Scandal. In 2020, a lot was going on and people started asking me about my opinions of certain things. I posted my direct feelings and opinions on those subjects. Then everyone started to come after me, saying that I was a racist and that they were going to kill me and my family, saying that if I ever left my house that I was going to get jumped, etc. I lost a shit ton of friends, but in all honesty, I'm glad that whole thing happened because it brought me back down to earth and broke that popular girl ego of mine, it also showed me who my true friends are. Chapter 13, Relapse. December 2021 to July of 2022 was certainly a mess. I entered a relationship that was going way too fast. I broke up with the guy after I realized how toxic and controlling he was. My mental health went down the drain after that. I was constantly having anxiety attacks and I was suicidal all the time, so much so that I went back on medication after four years of being off of it. My father landed in the hospital due to not being able to breathe and he was later diagnosed 
so it's COPD. Eventually, I got over the guy I entered the seriously toxic and controlling relationship with, but I forced myself to block him and completely remove him from my life I, because I kept going back to him. My father got out of the hospital, and then only a month later, he landed back in the hospital, thankfully only for the night, and he was released the next morning. Slowly, my mental health got better. Everything was good until the unthinkable happened to me in July. Chapter 14, My Assault In April of 2022, I met this guy. He seemed nice and sweet, and we became fast friends. We always enjoyed talking to each other. So on July 15, 2022, we were in the same area as each other, so we figured that we would meet up. I was waiting outside for him for about 15 to 20 minutes. I was ready to go back inside until he showed up. Right away, I picked up that there was something off about him, but I just brushed it off. He was really touchy-feely, which I didn't like. I, I tried to reject his hug, but he pulled me in for one anyway. I pushed myself away from him, and he then wanted to take a picture. I, I told him I didn't want a picture to be taken, but he took it anyway. I covered my face with my hood of my sweater. So then I just tried to mind my business and go on my phone. He then started steering the conversation into a sexual subject. I tried to steer the conversation away from that subject. He then said he wanted to see new, nude pictures of myself so that he could keep them. I told them that I had nothing like that on my phone. He continued to pull me into these aggressive headlocks. I told him I didn't like that and pushed away from me. Then I straightened out my back because it hurt from my scoliosis. He asked me if my back hurt. I said, yeah. He then proceeded to put his hands up my sweater, under my bra strap, and rub my back. I tried to move away from him, but then I realized he started to undo the claps on my bra. I slapped his hand away from my back and moved as far away from him as possible. I reclasped my bra and then there was a voice that said to me, you need to get out of here or he's going to take advantage of you. So I was thinking of a way to get out of this horrible situation. He grabbed my thigh and began to caress it. I once again slapped his hand away and then a light bulb went off in my head. Tell him you have a cough, you need to go. So that's what I did. The next thing he said to me will forever send chills down my spine. I'll see you tomorrow. As I was walking back inside, I felt like a whore. I felt dirty and I could feel that his touch crawling under my skin. My dad asked me if everything was okay. I just said it. And I said, yeah, everything is fine. And then proceeded to lay down and tried to justify what happened five minutes ago. The only thing that justified it was that I was assaulted. I started crying and my dad asked me what I was wrong. The only words that came out of my mouth were, I was assaulted. He then proceeded to call 911 and told them what happened. As we were waiting for the cops to show up, he notified my mom, my sister, and my brother-in-law. The police showed up about 15 minutes after the 911 call was made. They questioned me on what happened and I told them everything. My sister and brother-in-law showed up next. When I saw my sister, I just started bawling. The police asked me if I could show them where everything happened. I brought them to the place where it happened and proceeded to relive what happened just there just an hour before. The police proceeded to lead me back inside and gather up the last pieces of information. He asked me if I would like to press charges against him. I said yes. The officer gave me the station's card and said if I ever remember anything, just to give him a call. Then my mother showed up. She tried to hug me, but I didn't want to be touched. To lighten the sorrow mood, my brother-in-law told this hilarious story and jokes. Between the laughter, I began crying again. I told them I was scared to stay in the same place because he told me, I'll see you tomorrow. I decided to stay with my sister and brother-in-law for the night, then I would stay with my mother for the next day. So I got my things and went with my sister and brother-in-law. As we were walking to the car, I couldn't help but look over my shoulder constantly. The car ride to their house was so fun, filled with jokes and laughter. That night felt like a normal night. When we got to their house and after I settled in, 
I, they went to bed. The first thing I did was take a shower. I scrubbed and scrubbed until my skin was red. I was trying to get the whore that I felt off of me. Then I got into pajamas and tried to sleep. I couldn't, so I started cleaning everything. I soon got tired and went to sleep. The following days were just as hard, if not harder, to cope with than that night. Chapter 15. How I Moved On That morning, my sister, brother-in-law, and I went to Denny's. I got the pancakes. As I was waiting, I stirred the ice in my water with the straw, and just like the straw and ice, I replayed the previous night in my head over and over again. I really tried to be present, but I couldn't. My sister had to snap me out of it multiple times, so I tried to eat, but my appetite was simply gone. Then my mother picked me up. All I remember from that day was taking a bubble bath and crying. I kept saying that it was all my fault and that I was the cause of this. She kept saying that I wasn't and that he's the one who caused all of this, but it just didn't help. The following days were quite normal. It didn't really phase me. Sometimes now it does, though. I try not to think about it, but it's no use. I do think writing this in here is a good way to finally have some closure on the matter. My birthday was the next week after this all happened. I have to say I couldn't care less about it. But a couple days before my birthday, I was gifted the most wonderful news that I'm going to be an auntie. I was, I'm very excited. My niece is the best birthday present I could ever ask for. I love her so much already. Chapter 16. My Plans A lot of things have been going smooth lately. I've been happy and content about where I am personally. I quit YouTube about three weeks ago because it was quite literally taking up my entire life, and now I have so much free time to do what I want to do, like writing this book. I have also been focusing on myself more in what I want my career path to be. I'm also trying to work on myself and be the best role model for my niece as much as I can be. Acknowledgements. If it wasn't for all my families and friends, I'm not sure I'd even be alive to tell my story. Thank you all.